Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. With me, as usual, is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. How are you doing, Rob? Stephen, hello. Hello. And uh, we have a, a fantastic guest today, uh, Steve O'Donnell. Uh, we worked together way in the past, and he, he did some stuff for me, and he's, he's just amazing. And he's currently a senior analyst at something called Global Hive. Um, he has a history running um, some massively large data centers and um, you know, I'll let him kind of tell us a little bit about his background before we jump in. So Stephen, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Sure. So um, yeah, I, I guess I have run lots of very big data centers. I, I used to run operations for British Telecom, um, built lots of data centers, operated lots of data centers. I think if I remember rightly, it was 5,736 technical facilities around the world, which is one of the biggest um, uh, one of the biggest um, uh, sort of estates I think there is around. Everything from central offices to really large um, data centers that were either operating, even in, in those days, because there's some time ago, in a hyperscale environment with heavily virtualized platforms and uh, British Telecom were selling virtualized servers in much the same way as Amazon Web Services do today, uh, all the way through to co-location, you know, the standard columns or racks uh, where you, you go and buy a rack or you go and buy a piece of a floor space. And then we were, were delivering massive um, uh, internal applications as well, like BT Vision, um, which is uh, one of the first internet driven uh, TV um, uh, uh, capabilities in, in all of Europe. So really pretty massive stuff. Um, and when I was there, I, I met a whole lot of, of really good buddies uh, from across the industry, loads of hyperscale guys who are really finding their feet about how to build massive scale, hyperscale data center facilities. And um, we, we all kind of hung out together and worked out how to do this stuff properly. So um, really, really interesting time. When you say learn how to do this properly, how much of that's environmental? How much of that is the, the software? Where, where's the, where are the lessons learned that, that start creeping in on this? Okay, it's all about starting off the right way. So um, I think it was Google who invented the, the term was the, the data center as the computer. That is, that if, if what you do is you optimize each individual component to make the component highly efficient, what happens is that you don't make the whole ecosystem highly efficient. If, however, you start off and you say, right, what we want to do is you want to make the whole ecosystem efficient, you tear down the barriers between storage and compute and network and cooling and power, and you, you actually design the whole end-to-end -end system to be optimal. And that's the critical piece of thinking. It's because in the past, we were always about, oh, we'll buy a disk drive and we'll buy a, a motherboard and um, we'll put these together and we get a server and we'll plug servers in. Everything's modular so that you could, you could kind of be really flexible. Whilst in a hyperscale environment, you don't want that. Everything's going to be the same. You know, you're, if you're Google or something like that, you're going to be doing MapReduce or um, you're going to be running some, uh, something where it's everything looks the same um, and um, you want your, your platforms all to be identical and you want them to be mass produced. So they, they all look the same and you can just roll them out and you, you can increase the capacity trivially. So, so but when, I, when I hear you say that, it, it makes a lot of sense to me and I think system design is critical. Yeah. At the same time, these companies are incredibly innovative, right? They're rolling out new hardware types. They're, they're you know, new, new capabilities, right? They've got em enormous fleets and they, they, so they have to roll change through those fleets. How, do, how does a company at that scale cope with incremental innovation without, without sort of saying no all the time? Well, they, 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 they plainly don't say no. Um, yeah. they, they, they're, they're very, they're very, financially driven. So one of the things, I mean, way back was about 2004, I think when Google really started to scale up um, their platforms, they decided that they, they needed to make search cheap. And, and, and the, the, real, the real thing that, that helped them to drive that innovation 
was driving the costs out of the data centers. And they did that by making them modular and making them really stripped down, stripping out everything that wasn't necessary um, and, and actually building a lot of the resilience into the software rather than into the hardware. So in a typical investment banking, you know, I've worked in investment banking too, I worked at Deutsche Bank and uh, Lehman Brothers. So um, in an investment banking world, you have two N, that is, you've got one computer and you've got another one that's backing it up. And oh, you've got one data center, you've got another data center, you've got one storage array, you've got another storage array, you've got switches, everything is duplicated. And then you, you spend a lot of time architecting things so that there's no single and very often no, no a double point of failure. So lose one box, nothing happens. Lose two boxes, mostly nothing happens. Lose three boxes, you're in trouble. But it's a very expensive way to do it. It's very slow, very expensive, and very inflexible. Whilst if you're on hyperscale, you basically say, well, we need to build something, a bit like Netflix, we need to build something that can survive the Symbian army, which is, you know about Netflix's Symbian army? Um, I do, but go ahead and explain uh, it for the audience. Okay. This, is, this is the coolest thing in the world. So basically what these guys say, we need something that's resilient. And we tell developers to make software that's resilient, that will survive if, if one process fails or a database crashes here, a piece of hardware falls over. Make the software so it will recover and then test it. But nobody tests it properly. The Symbian <laughs> Army, Symbian Army is running constantly on the whole Netflix environment and it just tears down servers, bits of storage, network connections, and the, the gorillas tear down data centers as well. Chaos monkeys. Because the software it's has to survive in this, it's a bit like evolution, isn't it? You know, if, if the software doesn't survive, then it's no good. So the software has to be written in such a way that it can survive the Symbian army. And then what? It means it can survive real life. And I agree it's stress. They're injecting yeah. stress into the system to ensure, right. re ensure resiliency. And, it, and, and it's, it's really evolutionary thinking. It means, you know, uh, if you, you know, the dinosaurs, why did the dinosaurs disappear? Because there was a big meteor or some, something like that, I don't know. Um, they were not, not able of surviving through that, whilst the cockroaches were. So the cockroaches have lived and the dinosaurs are dead. Um, okay. Yeah. And that's, so, and so that, that makes a lot of sense to me, but it, I still, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around, you know, Google shows up with, a new generation of, actually there's two things in this, because yeah. we've, we've also seen the hyperscalers starting to build FPGAs into their hardware so that they can off, offload you know, network processing or they can take advantage of GPUs mm -hmm. uh, or, or specialized analytics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are, we're definitely seeing that in the hardware at hyperscale as part of their, their, yeah. their methodology. And in some ways, I guess that's saying, I don't need I don't want an ASIC anymore, right? I know this is actually Microsoft's designs mm -hmm. in the open compute space. They were putting field programmable gate array chips into mm -hmm. their NICs because the ASICs weren't being revved fast enough for them to accommodate all of the network logic that they wanted to embed in, in the servers. Yeah. Um, that's a totally different way of thinking about server design. Yeah, it is. And I, th I think if we think about this, um, it, it's, it's not just the integration of all the hardware elements in the ecosystem, it's the integration of all the software elements too. Let's, let's think about why, why was MapReduce actually invented? It was, it was invented because problems were too big and they needed to be carved up into small slices that then could be executed on independently. Now the problem with that is that if you try and do that in, in the normal conventional way, you get a great big storage array maybe made by Dell or EMC, and it chokes. It just can't deal with the bandwidth. So you then scatter the disks across the environment. You make the computer and the disk the same thing rather than having a, a, a centralized disk array. Um, and then you run into speed of light issues because if you've got the compute acting on the data and the data is too far away from the compute, the latency absolutely kills the performance of the application and your search takes too long, or your other stuff you're trying to take too long. So you then invent software like MapReduce that actually makes sure that the data and the compute 
are integrated together. Um, equally, when you run out of steam or maybe your compute's too expensive because Intel processors cost a fortune, maybe you, you go and look at something else that can give you more compute for less bucks because these guys write their own software and they write their own software all the way down the stack. We look at what's happening with containers, bare metal. It's all about strip, 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 take away all the stuff that we don't need, make it really minimalist, make each individual element completely autonomous. That is, um, if, it, uh, if it fails, it can be restarted in a flash. Um, make, deliberately try and make your software stateless so that um, uh, it doesn't have any data to go and recover from and the whole thing just carries on. It's all about this end-to-end -end system design. It's about solving a business problem. Now, you asked about how do, how do these companies go about refreshing? Well, they, you don't just build a data center and chuck a whole lot of computing and storage hardware in there and it, it lasts for 15 years. Absolutely not. Right. Inside the data center, most things are fairly modular. So uh, you, you see things like shipping containers and data centers or certainly modular arrays that are self-contained. They've got their own cooling, very often air, air cooling, very often DC power rather than AC power. Maybe I can come back to that in a moment because that strips out a whole lot of unnecessary gubbins, things that you don't really need. Right. Um, and what happens is that this stuff sits in the data center and when it breaks, they just, it just gets left. Nobody cares. Nobody tries to fix it. They just <laughs> leave it there because it's too expensive to replace it. And then once the cost of electricity versus the compute capability of the platform they're running on, once, that, once those two lines intersect, they say, right, throw that one away, get some new stuff. That's typically about 18 months at the moment. So 18 months cycle is a complete refresh of the data center, much, much shorter than the typical enterprise. So would that mean that operationally, they, they actually are getting rid of machines that don't fit their operational model? Because yes. you know, they've, they've, I know they're on very aggressive automation, right? They're completely hands off, new systems come in, they go through yeah. a complete cycle, they're rebooted yeah. on a regular basis. Um, Right, it's, it's a very different management paradigm than, than a traditional IT data center where it's, you know, systems stay up for, for years yeah. at a time and they buy machines once every five years and then celebrate when they get an extra two years of use out of it. Something like that, yeah. So they're, they're literally saying, all right, this machine is 18 months old. They're, they're obsoleting it not because it doesn't run, but because they, you know, because they can't manage it because it doesn't have the latest tech. Well, no, the, they're, they're actually doing it because, because of the cost of electricity. Okay. When you look at, so you got a piece of real estate and you add up, when you add up the cost of that chunk of space inside your hyperscale data center, you've got cooling, you've got electricity, you've got network capacity, um, and then you've got the capital depreciation of the equipment that you put in the space. That gives you a certain amount of output. It's, it's manufacturing, a certain amount of output. Once the cost per whatever it is that they're measuring, memory, CPU cycles, you know, storage, once that no longer stacks up against new stuff, it's quite ruthless. Goodbye old stuff, bring in new stuff because it, it costs in. It's all done by ROI. The accountants work out what the refresh cycle is. Unlike the accountants in typical enterprises who really don't look at it in that way. Um, and, and often because typical enterprise data centers are running at 15 to 20% utilization. Hyperscale data centers want to run it as close to 100% utilization as they possibly can. So if we turn that around and look at edge infrastructure, yeah. right? So an edge, an edge data center and, and uh, we can, if, if you want, we can spend some time actually defining what edge means in, in yeah. well, I've been, you. I've been spending the last three months actually defining what an edge data center is. So I'm I interested to hear your definition. I think I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So shall I answer that question first? That's probably the best. Yes, yeah, yes please. And then that'll lead us into a, a, a merry set of uh, 
Okay. So the first thing, questions. the first thing is that, you know, why would you, why would you want an edge data center? That's the critical question. And the, what you have to do is you have to start off by looking at use cases. What are the use cases that would mandate an edge data center? Why wouldn't you just go and shove something in a, in a data center in some big square state in the middle of the US where the electricity is cheap? Because the steel right. tends to down and you know, you've got cheap land and, um, and so on. Why wouldn't you just do that? Well, if you think about that, that's driven by constraints, the constraints that are linked back to the use cases. So you look at the use cases and you, and you determine which of those use cases fail to operate in a big data center in, I don't know, I think in Nebraska for the sake of arguments, okay, rather than in a, a small edge data center in the middle of Beijing or downtown LA. Right. And I did some work, analyzed pretty much every use case I, I could think of. I then went out and interviewed a whole lot of hyperscale guys, colo guys, enterprise guys, car manufacturers, governments, and so on. And I came up with 25 basic use cases. <laughs> okay, just 20? It's 25. 25. <laughs> 25 use cases that mandate edge. And the things, the things, ah, that, okay. the things that mandate edge are typically latency, um, sometimes um, human, human life dependency. So if you're driving an autonom autonomous car, you don't want to be depending on the network. You want something that's going to do something very, very locally. Um, or it might be you're being operated on by a robot. Um, you know, you want you want something mm -hmm. locally. Got the smart. You, you don't you don't want a, a DNS issue to uh, cause cause the scalpel to, to not go. We're on the That's same right. page. Good, okay. Um, so basically, you can categorize these things. So twenty five use cases. You then start doing the the date that the work on. What are the workload characteristics of these uh, of these use cases? So how much compute and storage do they need? What about latency? Um, what about network connectivity? Um, and then, and, 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 and by the way, you've got to sprinkle in a bit, a little bit of 5G. Are you aware of 5G? Uh, is very, it? very. So 5, 5G for listeners is the new uh, protocol for cell phones that promises to be very high bandwidth, very low latency, mm -hmm. and very short range, which means right. that we're going to have a lot of towers uh, coming, coming, to a, coming to a neighborhood near you. Well, actually, let's just take that stage further. So a gigabit, okay? So you basically got local gigabit ethernet on your handheld device, okay, which is pretty cool. A latency, one to two milliseconds. And if you look at latency from Europe to the United States, it's over 100 milliseconds. Um, if you look at latency to a fairly local data center um, from a mobile device, it's at least 20 milliseconds. So we're looking at order of magnitude differences in latency. So one, one of the other ways I like to think of latency is when you, when you put on a pair of virtual reality goggles, the latency, if you have too much latency, and I, I don't know the exact number, maybe you do, but, the, but if you have too much latency in the, in the mm -hmm. response of those goggles, you will get it a makes, headache. It makes you sick. It right. actually makes you want to vomit because it absolutely just does your head in. It's completely, mad. Um, so if you want um, virtual reality or enhanced reality, so you might have military applications, remember you're a tank commander um, and you want to have a, he a, heads, a real enhanced reality virtual heads up display that helps you to go and win a war or um, you might be a, uh, an autonomous vehicle um, that requires that kind of, that kind of stuff then low latency is absolutely mission critical. It's, an, it's a non, you can't argue about it, you've got to have it, it's essential. So low latency, and then very often um, we find that we've got insane quantities of data, just off the charts, insane quantities of data that get captured locally. Let's think about things like uh, uh, the, the, the hydron, um, you know, the, the hydron thing in, in CERN. CERN, uh, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, so, that, you know, you've got, you've got bang as two, two uh, particles come together 
and then you've got to capture all that data and process the hell out of it. We're going to ship that to to Nevada or no, <laughs> no, it's never going to happen. Okay, so it needs to be so basically the constraints on the use cases. There's 25 of them, and then if you boil those use cases down, what you find is that you end up with five archetypes because 25 use cases are you can you can actually so you have a five by five grid yeah you, you end up with a, with a little sort of set bit of set theory and you say well these five are all the same and these five and these three are the same as those and those seven are the same as those and you end up with five archetypes and that then informs you about what the characteristics of an edge data center are and it will tell you things like what the cell size is so how many of them do you need per square hundred miles or, uh, okay. or, or whatever? Do you want five in a building or one in a major city, uh, depending upon the use case? So we've done all that work. And, and, and basically what edge data centers are for, um, it's not pretty, it's really not what the market is saying about them. What edge use cases are for, they're for use cases that are constrained by latency, bandwidth, and data um, that then mean that you've got to be close to the consumer. And we're going to find edge, edge data centers in areas of high population typically, because most of these cases are population centric, but not all. We're going to find edge data centers that could be as small as a piece of street furniture so let's talk about what a piece of street furniture is. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> well, street well, street well, furniture is not a comparison I've used it traditionally in IT. Well, a piece of street furniture is you sometimes see boxes on the side of the street where AT&T ah. or BT put in their, their, their network. And then if they're putting a new telephone in or if they're putting in a, a new cable connection to your home, they'll right. wire it in. So street furniture is on the street. It's basically a box that's got electronics in it. It might be at the bottom of a cell tower, um, or if you've got femtocells, um, that is um, cell capability inside buildings, you might have the edge data center associated with that. Sure. Because 5G requires compute as well. So there's a whole series of these things, and you'll have small street furniture type edge data centers, and then you'll have larger neighborhood um, uh, edge data centers, and then you'll have city style edge data centers, and then you're into the cloud. And that's, so the, the, the architecture is it's multi-tiered. So do you, do you think of that as like a distinct edge core and cloud, or is it to you just, there's a whole bunch of tiers and they're gonna be managed. It, you're, you're, end up, you're gonna end up not caring which tier you're in, you're gonna pick by latency or by. You, you pick by use case. And here's the other, the other thing I think that's going to be true. We think now, we think, okay, well, firms like Uber and Google and Facebook um, and Amazon uh, got very, very deep pockets, huge uh, access to public markets to raise capital and build these data centers. Microsoft, um, no one has got the capital uh, to build all the edge data centers Correct. That can't be done. Okay, so that tells me that edge data centers are going to be multi tenanted Edge data centers are going to be. I usually have to draw that. I usually have to draw that statement out for people. I like that you jump. You jump to it. I, I strongly agree. Yeah. They have to be multi tenanted Right, and then you know the obvious place is that as multi tenanted is it the telcos who operate the data centers or? Is it lots of lots of small colo um, providers? So we, we hear about firms like Edge Connects, we, um, who, who are building lots of data centers from Microsoft. I'm not sure they've quite got Edge yet, by the way, although they've got the, that as a name, they haven't quite understood what it's all about, I don't think. Um, I think it's a bit like cloud, you know? We all talked about cloud, there's a lot of, you know, uh, buzzword bingo going on. Um, yeah. um, what cloud was, nobody really understood it. I think we probably understand it a bit better now because we all, well, we use it, don't we? It's it's part of our everyday life. I think that's where we are with Edge now. We, we haven't quite got an understanding in the general market of what Edge is and why it has to be. Um, once we've got that, it's gonna become really obvious 
that the, um, the place that this lives is either with the telcos in central offices. Will it be with governments? Well, government can never get out of its own way, so that's highly unlikely. Yeah. I'm not um, sure telcos can get out of their own way either. So. I, I, I think you're right. Um, <laughs> or is it with highly entrepreneurial companies who are building coal? And yeah. then, because what we're going to find is that you might find companies with business models like Akamai, who sell, you know, for the, for the right. listeners. They're already, they're, uh, Akamai's a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Akamai could basically do content management. So if you want to download the latest version of OS X, Akamai spread it all over the world so that Cupertino doesn't melt down. Um, and um, they, they also do things like uh, put popular Facebook pictures from uh, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> the world's or, largest collection of cats. Yeah, cat that's right. Yes. There you go. Right, okay. All over the place. So that, so that they can actually, and, and this is really important actually because if we think about this, the internet is going to turn inside out. Let me explain what I mean by this. A very good Once point. we yeah. attach 5G to the internet, the edge becomes more capable than the core. Right. Right? It's really important that. It's a really important concept. You've got one gigabit from hundreds of millions of devices, but the, the backhaul network that's going to try and bring it all together it just hasn't got the capacity and we can't afford to build the capacity. So we're going to have to, just by definition, we're going to have to do stuff at the edge. We're, the thing that amazes me in, in looking at all this is that we're really in a, in a flip perspective, right? When we built the internet, data came from centralized locations out to the edges. Yep. And that was pretty much the flow was, was really unidirectional from center to edge. Yeah. And in the models that we're talking about, the flow is almost completely reverse, where yes. the data is streaming from the edge in enormous quantities with relatively small channels backwards right. uh, to the other, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think of video. Video is a good example, right? We might have hundreds of cameras streaming up to, a, to, a, to storage or analysis or processing, and only one of those cameras is actually being watched or used or have any relevant yeah. information. Because you basically we're into the, the business model now of um, write once, read not, read never. Um, yes. Okay. So people people are taking pictures, and never look at them again. Um, they're taking videos, they never look at them again. Um, That's and, uh, yeah, it, it, it's insane. Anyway, so it, I, I think I think that's I think that's that's really this edge, and I've, I've tried to define it as clearly as I can. And I like I like your definition. It's 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 almost a game that we play for this podcast of, of how do you define the edge? Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you mine, um, yeah. which is is very simple. I think edge is anything that's not cloud. Um, and really? and the and the reason so that, the, that sorry, means that my enterprise data center edge. It does indeed. You jump to the you jump to the prize. <laughs> I, so what, what, what I believe when I look at cloud infrastructure is it has to do with an operational model. It has to do with the services model um, and a multi-tenancy model, um, right? And those things are pretty well understood today. We, understood, we understand what Amazon looks like and we build applications for Amazon. If I want to write an application anywhere else, I'm sort of on my own. Hmm. I don't have all those services. I don't have the capabilities. I don't have the management. I have, I have a whole different set of concerns. Yeah. And it, the, the concerns, but if I compare um, a telco data center in the middle of a field in Nebraska, right, servicing you know, uh, IoT applications for the field to an enterprise data center, they're much, much more similar than, than either of those two infrastructures are to Amazon. Mm -hmm. from services, capabilities, platform, all these utilities, right? Enterprise data centers really don't have minimal services and capabilities, <laughs> uh, much to the chagrin of people who have to write to, write to enterprise data centers. Yeah. Uh, and so, so from my perspective, when, when I look at us building really interesting applications and putting platforms on edge and things like that, the, the real challenge isn't can I put hardware on the edge? It's actually, can I provide enough services to make the applications work well? Yes. No, I fundamentally agree. And, and, and 
I actually think you're completely right about enterprise data centers. They may be very rich in, in a hardware, from a hardware perspective, but actually they're very poor from a software perspective. They don't have all of that integration, all of that automation, all of the zero touch, you know, roll stuff out, the continuous integration type capability that you get in a hyperscale data center just doesn't exist. You know, you've got things like stupid release cycles and uh, 90 day so, change windows and shit. So this is, so this is where my head goes with edge, because if I'm building an edge application and it's replicated hundreds of thousands of times, right? 5G is going to create millions of data centers effectively. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think that's right. Those are going to be managed using cloud type zero touch technologies. Not I, they're not IT infrastructures, they're cloud you're infrastructure. You're gonna have a lot of little guys in vans, right, going around um, fixing shit and pressing buttons. That's just not gonna happen. Forget that. It's unaffordable, undoable. Right. Right. And 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 it's even less and this is where multi-tenancy comes in, right? What you you might have a company that maintains that data center. Yeah. And then ideally it's going to be share a shared resource between tens or hundreds of different companies using, yeah. using that resource. No, I agree. So I, is there any, I mean, do you see any, anybody who's, who's there yet? I mean, it's, it, it, it feels sort of like what Amazon needs, but doesn't feel very Amazon like to me. Is this, a, is this going to be owned by, a, you know, the cloud infrastructure people, or is there this a greenfield opportunity? I, I think I, I feel like an explorer. I think I, <laughs> I think in many ways I think I put a flag in the top of Mount Everest. You know, no one's been there before, and actually looked down and seen how it all works. Um, so may, maybe there are the I mean, there's a lot of there are some people, a lot of really smart people, but um, I'm I'm constantly surprised, and and uh, by, by by how I see something, and then. Four or five years later is accepted that that's absolutely the truth. Um, and, and I think if you're that embedded in, in the technology, you, you can get it really quickly. Um, and I think this is one of these cases. And, you know, that's, that's where my money's going, edge. Right? But am I going edge? I think I'm going to go edge a bit like the California gold rush. You know, I'm, I'm going to make some <laughs> and, uh, and make, make the money from the other guys that are taking all the risk. That means uh, you're going to set up a bar and everyone's going to come to convert <laughs> their edge uh, compute for alcohol. Is it, I think that's the way they made money. Well, no, I, no, no. I, I can see the only ones that McDonald's <laughs> edge, edge infrastructure saloon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bitcoin, cool. go. Um, no, I, I, I think that one of the things that we, we don't touch on very often and, and we don't have time to really delve into, um, but Stephen, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a moment to give us a, a, an insight sure. is – Edge infrastructure is is not, you know, you, you can't just have it can't be completely wide open to people, mm -hmm. uh, for for what I think is for a couple of different reasons. But but I'm interested to hear how it's different than cloud in your perspective from like that. Well, well, well my my view is that the, the these multi tenanted edge data centers are unlikely to be used by small companies. They're they're more likely to be. Um, places where large hyperscale services are offered. <clears throat> and those hyperscale services may be uh, government. Uh, so the government wants to uh, help manage the road network, the rail network, or the airline network or whatever. So they are doing lots of compute to measure traffic um, and ensure safety. Um, or it might be... Um, uh, autonomous ride sharing type stuff where um, they want to manage the vehicles. So someone like Uber or Lyft are getting involved in that. Um, or it might be uh, the military who want to provide um, uh, enhanced augmented reality type activities. Um, it might be shopping centers um, and retailers you actually want to enhance the shopping experience. Can you imagine walking in to a store and you get you get enhanced reality? So you you're looking at you're looking at the um, at the your woman perhaps you're looking at the clothes on the rack, and uh, 
that your augmented reality actually shows you wearing the clothes. Right. That's, that's radical and different. So it shows, do you fit these clothes? And then you can get away with changing rooms and just pick up the right thing and walk out the door. Um, you, you can just change the business model. Right. No, that makes a um, ton of sense. I, I, I agree. Uh, and um, I think that's exciting. I, I do, I do hope you're mm -hmm. wrong in the sense that, um, I, I really would love to see uh, smaller innovation or innovations, entrepreneurs who are able to take IOT edge infrastructure, you know, look at, look at a data, a data landscape at the edge and then deliver an app like we're, we get on the phones and, and create yeah. app stores for very small. Well, you, you, um, you're, probably, you're probably right, but yeah. let's, let's just think about this. Um, what's likely to happen is what happens today. We're going to end up with layers of services. So, if we, if we think about modern, modern living, think about anything at all that we consume and then do a configuration management database looking at all <laughs> of the dependencies. So to deliver your ride share from Uber, what do you actually need? Have you thought about that? You, you need a cell phone that's smart. You need GPS. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bore you, but yeah. you can my point, right? There's all this stuff that links in in a, in a sort of configuration database showing all of the dependencies on delivering this single service. And what Edge is going to do is it's going to offer these layers of services that then smaller entities like, you know, your, your local mom and pop shop might use to provide those virtual mirror capabilities um, in, their, in their garment store. Um, so I, I don't think we're restricting things and making it all for the big guys, but I think the big guys provide the layered underlying supporting platform services. The anchor tenants. Right. So yeah, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. I was no. going to say there's still hope for me to get rich in a lazy <laughs> way. That's uh, just by, by putting Bitcoin. Lazy, lazy <laughs> way. Bitcoin. I, 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 I got some content. Do you want to call? Oh, that's, that's my Alexa talking to me. See? <laughs> I said buy Bitcoin and, and Alexa's, Alexa's doing a transaction for you. Lucky you. <laughs> well, well Stephen, we're going to go ahead and uh, part of my job here is to shut down Rob because these things keep getting longer. I love to talk about this. And, and um, cool. but I have to tell you, this is a really great conversation. I um, really appreciate you having you on. If people want to follow you or track you, where should they go? They should go to at Stephen O'Donnell on Twitter. So S-T-E-P-H-E-N-O-D-O-N-N-E-L-L. -L. Um, I got a reasonable number of followers already. Mm -hmm. um, but, you so, know, unless, unless you, um, if you, if you like Mr. Trump, don't follow me. Because <laughs> Well, the good thing is you spell, you spell your name the proper way with the PH. Of course. Um, of course, my mother told me that I was supposed to be a Stephanie. And I think when I was born and turned out to be a boy, they just got rid of some letters. And that's why I have a PH. That's what they told me. You're a boy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. It's just terrible. It's good, to, it's good to know, Stephen, that I know you well it's enough. Never, it's never too late. <laughs> well, again, thank you uh, so much for uh, joining us. And um, certainly in a couple months, uh, we'll call you back and do another follow up. And because, yeah. you know, we had a different uh, podcast we recorded earlier that um, talked about the speed of innovation. Mm -hmm. And it was just things are so fast. I think six months time periods are good times to check in. By now, I think uh, what you talked about is what you think is going to happen. I think things will have happened and it'll give us a great checkpoint, but um, yeah. we need we to certainly enjoy you. We need to be careful here because we, 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 we underestimate and overestimate um, futurology at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we, we underestimate how quickly things happen and we overestimate how quickly things are going to happen. So in six months time, there will be some changes, but they'll be superficial but they'll be directionally heading towards the, the end game that we expect. Um, and then if we think, oh, nothing will happen for the next five years, well, that's nonsense too. <laughs> there'll, be, there'll be a lot of stuff that will happen by then. Um, but I just think humans are not very good at, at starting. No. Well, I know that Rob is secretly the uh, guy behind the whole Bitcoin thing. 
and I read uh, I don't know no one knows who he is but I but I believe he he may be the first trillionaire based at the current rate it's accelerating so uh, yeah. assuming that his bitcoins are, are are in a vault and accessible and not yeah, destroyed I, as part of a disk well, operation here's the thing right um the, the, the only way you can you can have something that's got incremental value is if there's a lot of liquidity and as soon as the market decides that it's not very liquid it's absolutely screwed um, but, well that's got to be coming uh, and I, I point you to um the did you read the book about tulips in amsterdam which is the a classic yeah. yeah amazing it's just it's it's got to be read yeah the good thing about tulips of course the tulip bulbs was that when you were starving to death because you had no money you could eat <laughs> Um, try, try eating a Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. That's a good point. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thanks again, guys. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close <laughs> off the podcast. And uh, we, we appreciate you taking some time to meet with us today. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Rob. Uh, pleasure. Thank you.